In 2011, the American Heritage Center began an oral history project to look at what residents, business owners, landowners, officials, and others in southeastern Wyoming thought of what might be coming their way, how oil development activities were affecting them at present, and how they were preparing for a ramp up if oil development began in earnest. It's real money and it's a real market play and there is oil there without a doubt. And I think that it depends on two things. The oil market, the world oil market, and if they can develop a procedure for successfully fracturing this formation. Oh, I absolutely think it's drill, baby, drill. <laughs> I'm quite certain these people are drill, baby, drill. I think they will regret it. Uh, drill, baby, drill. Yes, yeah, for most landowners. Wyoming is an extractive state with almost half its economy relying on the minerals industry. Some Wyoming communities have felt the benefits of easy to extract minerals in their backyard, but those communities have also felt the growing pains from rapid development and the eventual downturn or bust as those minerals are exhausted or the commodity price becomes too low to mine it profitably. Southeast Wyoming has yet to share in that boom and bust tradition when it comes to energy development. No, well the, the seismographers, when they came, oh. I mean it was like aliens had invaded. Oh. These big lights, last year they oh. came right at Christmas time and these big lights out on the ranch all over and be like who's out there wow. and they would just it would and then you could hear the thumping <laughs> and it was really kind of crazy and kind of a little bit huh. spooky you know it was probably um the fall of 2009 or or winter then early spring of 2010, if my memory serves me correctly. And, and it happened pretty quickly because suddenly we saw, you know, Halliburton vehicles and the motels and, and vehicles that didn't look like anything we'd ever seen here before. You know, if it isn't a, a hay truck or, a, you know, something like that, we just didn't know what it was. So then suddenly we were seeing these vehicles from Oklahoma and Texas and different parts of Wyoming where the um, energy um, sector had had been for many years and and so then suddenly we're seeing them here in a place where it's never been before during the initial phases of the Nibrary oil play we had as many as 20 landmen in this area working the tables, the records, and then they can find from that deed or whatever the document is who the, who the people were that owned the mineral rights. You know, it may be multiple people end up with the, with the mineral rights. You know, this corner of the state isn't impacted as much by energy, at least until now, which is, the, you know, I understand the focus of your, of your, you know, project here. But up until this time, we've been kind of isolated from the boom and bust of the energy fields, other than how it affected state, the state in general. You know, Wyoming's an energy state, so while Cheyenne hasn't been a beneficiary of that and it's something new and there was some of that emotional response, I think in general they thought, wow, it's our turn finally. Everybody, else, you know, because it's always been our deal that, hey, we don't get all that nice energy tax dollars, you know, and we're going to start getting a little of that, hopefully, and, and, uh, and not just from the oil that's pumped, but also from the jobs created. So 
I think most, the bulk of the community felt it was a positive thing as long as they advanced appropriately. It's a whole new set of jobs and a whole, it's a whole new industry on top of all the things that we were already doing. Um, the other thing that Niobrara has done is, uh, from where I sit right now, probably, have, pro probably more important um, in the last year and, and in the next year or two than, than the actual oil play itself but has been the, the attention that is brought for this area, trying to get on radar screens uh, to, to make Wyoming visible to the rest of the world, and certainly to make Southeast Wyoming visible. That's our charter. Um, the Niobrara has helped with that. Uh, we're, we're visible to a whole different segment of industry. For some residents, the question is not if resources will be extracted, but rather where, when, and what the benefit will be. You know. Platte and Goshen County are the two poorest counties in Wyoming. We've not had any mineral development to speak of in our counties. Uh, we're appreciative of any kind of economic development that, that comes our way, so um, we're not real picky. You know, Wheatland is a small town, 3,500 approximately, a lot of agriculture, and we've not been able to um, enjoy some of the new infrastructure and the rec centers and everything that a lot of the other communities have been able to obtain because of the minerals. And so I think the general consensus, of course, I can't speak for everybody, but the general consensus I think is very much excitement. In the fall of 2009, landmen representing a number of oil companies began showing up in Laramie, Goshen, and Platte County courthouses. They were researching ownership of land and mineral rights for the prospect of oil leases. But not always were the owners of the mineral rights the same as the owners of the land. Boom expectation was in the air, mixed with some trepidation and concern. About June of uh, this year, I got a telephone call and they wanted an oil lease. and. Uh, I didn't know anything about it, so I started doing my research. And the amount of money they offered me was about a third to a fourth less than what the actual fair market value for, money le for an oil lease is. Well, that's, you know, that was one thing. But then I discovered there was more things you had to go into, and one of them is called a split estate, where if you lease out the uh, mineral rights, basically the person who controls the mineral rights, actually controls the land. You have surface use, of course, but if you sign a surface agreement where they can come in and, and run over your land with their trucks and so forth, that's fine. You can do that. But if you don't, they can go out and get a bond and then they can do it anyhow, which means you lose control of your land. Every case that I've ever seen uh, they're better off, a landowner's much better off signing a surface use agreement than telling them they don't want them on there because they can post a bond with the Oil and Gas Commission and go ahead and go in anyway and they'll get no money. The seismic people have been uh, contacting you to maybe... Oh yeah, they've been pestering me and pestering me and pestering me. It's like they don't get the hint. <laughs> I'm not interested. <laughs> And uh, are you the owner of the mineral rights on this land? Uh, I don't think I am. Okay. So Maybe if I owned the mineral rights, I'd, I would be a little happier. But. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, if a guy owns the, the property, he ought to have just as much rights. I mean, you should be able to keep people off your land if you mm -hmm. don't want them on your land. As you get around Cheyenne, there's fewer people that want drilling. And they tend to be... Um, the more educated folks, the people that have moved here from out of state, that have bought their five acres of heaven or 40 acres of heaven, and they don't want anybody doing anything to it. Well, what brought you here to Cheyenne? Retirement. You don't want to be retired in California. Cheyenne is the best place to be retired. Now, as you get out into the county, deal with the ranchers and the farmers, who are truly the stewards of the land. They understand what's going on out here. They've been through this. They know generally what to look for and they're seeing the profit in it from not only the monies that come from the royalties because a lot of the folks don't own royalties 
but the landmen will come out and make certain deals for them that will allow them to expand their range. The bottom line is they just want money to keep doing what they love to do and I haven't, I haven't seen very many people get all this money come in, sell the ranch and go, go to uh, the Bahamas or something. You know, the, the, the oil wells are, are really not that intrusive as far as your day-to-day -day operations uh, on, a, on a farm or ranch. You know, they take up a, a relatively, you know, they make a relatively small footprint compared to the number of acres it takes for a family to make a living in agriculture nowadays. The energy footprint is extremely small, uh, half the size of what a typical farmyard might be. And you know, if they hit oil, the the impact w will be felt for generations in in these families. You know, sometimes uh, it's like winning the lottery. Sometimes it's it's for good, and sometimes it's not. So, but but the financial impact will, will be felt for generations. And With the push there's been in Torrington and Goshen County for economic development, I think people have. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, really changed their thinking uh, because of the fact they know that we need to diversify. But this property is also getting a lot of interest now with the develop, potential development in the Niagara. Interest from? from uh, well, the property has access to um, rail spurs me. with the uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad. Um, so there's interest in just the access to the rail, but then there's also possible use for the grain silos themselves to be refurbished to store frag sand. We're open to almost anything, and I, I, when I say we, the community's open to almost anything to, that would just strengthen and stabilize the local economy. They want to. They want to welcome the the energy companies and, and the folks that come with this energy development with open arms, because they're very eager for the economic development. Um, at the same time, uh, they don't want to get run over, and not everybody who li who has lived in that community is going to gain equally from the development. Some will do very well, others. Uh, won't. There was quite a bit of leasing done before the the big boom in leasing, you know, because there'd never been anything here in the history of mankind, so people um, gave up their rights pretty cheap initially. Yeah. And everybody didn't cash in on the uh, $1.7 million per square mile rate that the state got. They received a lot of cash. I, I know one landowner leased 80,000 acres and was paid 35 million dollars. Oh you know, I know of, I know of uh, landowners who uh, leased three or four years ago and got 10 to 25 dollars an acre and the neighbor didn't think that was enough and leased his for 300. Sure. <laughs> well, the wife comes home every day from school and says, have they started drilling yet? <laughs> so I can retire, so I don't have to face those sixth graders anymore? Oh, that's not true. <laughs> okay, well, once a week. It, well, you know, it would be nice to be able to think about retiring comfortably. Yeah, but boy, you... But you just mm, don't. No, you just can't. You know, I would like... I would like for my kids to be able to be out here. An opportunity. An right. opportunity. To raise an opportunity for that. Absolutely. Right. That's pretty big. That would be a huge one. Or to even be in Goshen County, have something to do in Goshen County. And, and right now, it's, you know, it's hard. I think a lot of communities in Wyoming, we see our kids leave, and especially in agriculture, what, what are they going to do? Come back and... And live well, on what? the farms, and like I mentioned earlier, the farms and ranches have gotten so much bigger and so much bigger and so much bigger, you know. There used to be a lot of small ranches around here. So it's not like they can come back and buy a little place. We've watched the, uh, the cost of our inputs for egg operations go up and up and up. We're watching oil come from uh, countries 
that are not friendly to the United States. It puts our self-defense and our economy in jeopardy. Uh, in the case of a landowner who has those mineral rights uh, and has the chance to collect some revenue, then it's a case of what can I do to improve my ranch? Gee, I'd love to have a new barn. I'd like to replace the 40-year-old tractor. Uh, I'd like to help the kids maybe build a house. Um, the merchants are going, gee, he might come buy a new pickup truck, or maybe I can sell lumber for that barn, or, you know, the list of the suppliers. How much do you feel like your hotel relies on the oil business that's uh, starting to come here? I was not anticipating or expecting them at all, you know. And uh, we, despite of without them, we would have definitely broke even. But all these capital projects that I have uh, finished this year, that would have had to, you know, I, I, I think without them, that would have not been possible, honestly. Because I got some of the, as, as I told you, you know, the money comes, I put it in the market again. So that's the way. If I think if these sort of, uh, and then only oil people doesn't come, it followed by the welding people, equipment suppliers, and some energy companies that supply those sand and waters to these people to, because I think they have to pump the water in the land to take those hydro, hydrophones in there, and then they take the, I guess the sonar sort of thing. You know, they send the sound signals and. So the, all the peripheral industry also develops, you know. The restaurant in town benefits. The gas station now in, in or return gas station will order more gas, so supply truck will start coming more and all that. So it is a chain if, chain thing, you know, chain reaction and so sort of thing. Uh, perhaps this is resisting progress, but I I I just if if we get a little bit of oil activity here, that's great. But I would almost rather not see a something like Pinedale. No residents have brought any concerns to me. You know, we, have, we don't have any real close wells being fracked. Prime Bluffs is supplied by all well water, so if it truly comes to light that fracking is a real concern to groundwater, then, then Pine Bluffs would need to be concerned. At this point, we're not. The realization of new hydraulic fracturing techniques has made it a real prospect to extract oil from the tight Niobrara Formation, which underlies portions of Laramie Platte and Goshen counties. Hydraulic fracturing refers to the procedure of pumping sand, water, and chemicals underground to open fissures to allow more oil and gas to flow to the well bore. New technologies bring opportunities for economic gain but also new concerns. The Niagara oil is, it's all rock. It has to be uh, fractured in order to release the gas and, and uh, fracking is what I think they call it, uh, to release the gas. That can go both ways. It can either hurt the environment and or there's already been some instances where it has, uh, where it has contaminated uh, stream, uh, contaminated streams, wells, and uh, artesian formations. I don't know, once you've lost natural resources like clean water, clean air, you can clean up the air, but ooh, cleaning up that groundwater is just difficult, if not impossible. I think there's been a lot of uh, information kind of going around about fracking that uh, people find um uh, unsettling it uh, uh, and you know and I'm convinced it it can be done uh, in an environmentally safe and sensitive way uh, but there's no question there have been problems caused by fracking primarily because somebody screwed up I don't know that we've been um, cautious necessarily or, or reserved I think We've tried to you know, hold our hands out and with the industry and say, hey, you know, come help us. Come teach us what you're doing. Let's educate the public. Because one of the things you know, we get a lot of is neighbors will call and say, They're, we don't want this. And this is ha having an impact. And we're, we're afraid of our water. We're afraid of, of the air. And so by helping um, ha have the energy industry educate us, we in turn 
have an opportunity to educate our citizens so that there isn't you know, sort of this fear out there. We're very comfortable with the fact that, that these wells are, are drilled uh, and, and cased carefully to about uh, you know, five to 8,000 feet and our water is our water level is down, you know, 150 to 300 feet. So there's there's more than a mile of, of rock in between whatever they're doing down there with their with their fracking, and and our water table. Now I understand that that's different in some states, like like uh, in their shale formation in Pennsylvania, uh, where they have apparently had had some issues. Their their uh, oil level and their water table are are close. So you know they may be having some some issues out there. We're we're not bothered by it. The fracking process uh, creates uh, or widens natural fissures down there to to a distance of, of hundreds of feet, not thousands of feet. So um, my family is not concerned about our water out there. We did talk about getting some baseline data, and it it would have been a good idea and we still can on one well. It, it, one well is not uh, completely fracked, one well is. Uh, actually the well that, that you're going to see today is, is uh, a half mile from our original home place house and the farmyard that we, that we use most often. You were working with the company you wanted to drill here. What was that relationship like? It's been just very satisfactory for me. I mean, they. Tr of course, when they come on the, the property and the first person to greet me said, you know, we're probably looking at a 20 or 30 year relationship here or more. Not with me, of course, but with the land and the family. And he said, we'll try to keep it as good on our side as we can. And if you have any questions at any time, you call Oklahoma City, you come on this site. If you find a guy, you ask him any question you want and we'll get you the answer. And have you had questions and had to oh, just, do that? I've, I spent hours. It was so intriguing to have that much machinery. You know, farming out here, agriculture, we're very cost conscious because our profit margin is very narrow. And it just shocked me to see them, you know, they broke this thing down in the middle of the night and I happened to be out here sitting in the vehicle and the guy called, started calling and found a piece in New Mexico got a flight to flight it in the next day because he had a full oil rig set in here and he had three crews running at 24 hours a day and he wasn't about to let this set idle while they got a piece. So the next morning they flew a big hunk of steel into Wheatland and they were in business again. It was just like nothing we see. Yeah, just the, the resources they have at hand yeah. to, exactly. to do what needs to be done. Yeah, and the, the and the capital. And the yeah. capital. I and mean, the capital when they want it done, they, do they it. get it done now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just been excellent yeah. to me, you know. And, uh, you know, we don't build cattle gates like that. Yeah, to we go, saw it. We open a gate, you know. In. That's a nice looking cattle gate. That, yeah. Is that one of theirs? That yes, yes. On the other oil well site, they improved what a half mile maybe or so of yes. the road over there, hauled in a bunch of gravel and, and uh, took what was just a pickup trail, you know, and improved it into a, a road over there. That was nice. I don't trust them. Whereas I do trust government to act on behalf of the public good. I just don't think industry ever will look at Deep Horizon. That was a series of human errors. And yet they were loath to account for it. Used to, we had a, a reputation for being rough and working quickly and not really taking any um, guidelines or safety precautions. That's changed drastically. I mean, the goal now is no incidents whatsoever. Uh, secondly, there's an environmental impact and there's an aspect to that that uh, we operate without spills and one of the easiest ways to make it easy for us to drill is to show that we're environmentally aware. How we handle our business is pretty easy to see. All you have to do is drive by the location. It's either clean or it's not. And um, 
personally, I've learned through the years, the only way to get invited back is to, to keep a good, tidy, professional location with no incidents. There's a lot of eyes that are on one rig. It's nothing to have six or seven analysts a day, or regulatory folks show up at will. Is that seen as too regulatory by the industry? <laughs> yes, it is actually, yeah. by some of them, uh, depending mm -hmm. on the size of the company. The smaller companies, they don't want to see anybody. Larger companies, they really don't care, show up. And the, I think the difference is, is some of the smaller companies, they're st still trying to turn a big profit for their, their investors. So when they see a regulatory analyst, the only thing they see is fines and dollars. Some, most do what they're supposed to. There's an occasional one or two that tend to cut a corner, and those are the ones that we generally catch on it. We go to our education point next, and sometimes we do have to go and issue them a summons and pull them into court. Many other areas of Wyoming, especially the western half of the state, have large tracts of federal land administered by such agencies as the Bureau of Land Management and the U.S. Forest Service. Leasing of land is done through these agencies, and federal regulatory policies apply. Southeast Wyoming is different in that its land is mostly in private hands, so regulatory policies are on the state level. Because they're not going to do it out of the goods of their heart. And what they're interested in is money, and so catch their interest and just set the laws so that there is reclamation, so that when there's water damage, uh, they, don't, they don't hide it, so that we know what they're doing, what fracking fluids are they using. So we can check for them in our wells beforehand. Uh, let our county commissioners know and pay a fee for using the county roads and let that fee not go somewhere else, but let it go back to the roads. Uh, you know, every time there's a road, there's dead antelope. Okay, so game and fish should be getting something for habitat restoration. Uh, you know, the Platte River could use some, a lot of uh, restoration, more parks, more public access. The companies that are in here, you know, affecting our land, they, they could help us be, make some, not mitigation for what they're doing, that should be the bare minimum, but there should be compensation in other ways. We have no zoning in this county. People don't like zoning here. I don't like zoning. You know, I don't like Big Brother telling me what to do per personally. Uh, and uh, people here just aren't big on zoning, and so we probably won't see zoning. Without zoning, you don't have rules you can throw out to them that they have to follow. The industry knows that they need cooperation. The industry knows that they don't need roadblocks. The industry knows that a half a day shutdown is a bad and expensive thing. Yes, we do have authority. Our authority primarily rests in safety. If we feel it is unsafe, we have virtually unlimited authority. In the case of the well that we just drilled on the hill up here, it was new for everybody here, but we successfully drilled it with a very low environmental impact, uh, incident free. We never had a single injury. We never had a single unplanned event. And uh, the local community still is on board with us. Look how thick that is. It's like black strap molasses, it reminds me of. It's a reddish brown in color. Yeah. And instead of looking like the old black tar, like we saw in the movies, they say it's very high quality. Oh, I think it's going to be just ugly if we do end up with a boom. I really do. And I don't know how you prepare for something like that. You know, I really don't. As far as you know, having the infrastructure and what have you, I, I think we're way behind on that. And there's no way of really catching up because you don't know whether you got the money to spend on that kind of stuff. So I'd love to have a bigger shop, you know, but, you know, without the known, whether it's for sure real or not, it ain't going to happen. You just make do with what you got and what comes through the door and make it work. Well, the few people that are working in the industry that I've talked to um, says it's just way too early to tell until they, you know, um, actually have some wells and they actually do know that uh, the oil is there. 
you know, but until they do know that, you know, they could pull up and leave just as easy. It's, the industry has been very honest and open in that they don't know. And I, they don't know. It's exploratory. The word that you hear most commonly used is this is exploratory. We don't know. I think something will happen. In one, two, five, ten years, yeah, I do. You know, I wouldn't hardly say I'm excited. I just, uh, if it does, it does, and if it doesn't, we'll just keep on like we've been doing, and that's been pretty good, so. The Niobrara oil play has yet to take off, but one area of the state, the southern Powder River Basin, appears to be more of a sure thing when it comes to oil and gas development. With their resources of uranium, coal, wind, oil, and natural gas, Converse County has ridden the roller coaster of energy development. All has been exploited at one time or another. I think in the last couple of weeks we've seen where it looks like it's probably a sure thing. It's, it's in this county especially. Uh, Converse County is, they can pretty well say, yeah, uh, Converse County's gonna be really booming. How do you, we always do you say, do Lord, now? give us another boom. We'll, we'll learn this time. And, but we're, we'll be wiser. In this town, we've learned our lesson. So I'd like to say that. They are aware of the industry's benefits and downfalls. But it's still difficult to know how to prepare when you're not quite sure what's coming or how soon. Mostly, again, it's people anticipating what's rolling at us, which we haven't actually seen hit yet. But we, uh, we hear continual message, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Um, in fact, people have even compared us to, we're going to be another Williston, North Dakota, or right, right. People think that we could have that kind of level of activity hit us. Williston, North Dakota, a sleepy town less than 10 years ago, is now the site of America's largest oil boom. Between 2007 and 2012, the number of residents more than doubled. The influx left the town unprepared and ill-equipped to provide services along with infrastructure. Wyoming is now faced with some of the same issues that plague Williston, North Dakota. In addition to more housing, heavy industry requires added infrastructure. If indeed there is a boom, roads and services are needed. The question is, how much and who pays? The number of wells that were active uh, being uh, explored in Wyoming in a given year from 2000 to 2008, I think, was somewhere in the 90s. Um, last year, Covers County had almost that many um, and permitted. Not all of them were being drilled because they couldn't get the, the rigs up here. Um, we're told, and no one will confirm it, that there will be that kind of numbers again this summer um, and then we could have 20 more wells in here in the next month, more drilling rigs with crews. I don't know where they're going to stay or how that's going to impact us. We are getting a lot of calls from very creative citizens who are looking to convert garages to living space and, um, and, and in other ways trying to accommodate uh, people that are looking for housing or who are gearing up because again, they're, they're hearing the supposition that, you know, that we will be hit hard. Douglas has needed housing for a long time, but everybody's been afraid to invest in the kind of money you have to do to the subdivision because we've seen the bus and everybody around here has been through them. And the construction companies have tried to live through them and some of them haven't made it. Um, and so now what you have is construction companies getting loans, uh, banks loaning on them, um, for subdivisions to be developed, and we have several going on right now, which for 20 years we didn't have any. The city will be the first to tell you that, um, you know, that they budget for the city dump. They budgeted for refuge sewage at an X amount of dollars a year as income. So. There are literally man camps at almost every drilling site in the county, and these man camps have that sewage pumped, and then it comes to the city dump for dump for disposal. And um, 
what I was told by the city manager is that they budgeted them for five thousand dollars a year and they're making twenty thousand a month. Hmm. That, is, that tells you there are an awful lot of people out there in the county that are in man counts. How busy are you right now? We're swamped. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of opportunity. I think every night of different businesses I should be starting and things that we could be doing just run out of time and energy. I guess the big benefit with mining industry and the oil and gas I see is it affects so much more than what happens in the field. There are pumps, there are motors, there are you name it. Um, it just opens up so many doors for clothing. Now we all have to wear this fire retardant clothing. I mean, open up a clothes store, it, it, it's endless what this brings to these communities. In 1980, we did a million dollars worth of business. And by the end of 81, 82, we dropped down to 300,000. That's a big drop. And to hang on and hang on and hang on and hang on. The only things that we had in them times was we had, at the end of the season, we always had uh, the state fair and hunting season, and that's what carried us through. We've had to sit here all these years just scraping by, hoping that once again the energy business would come back. And uh, what a better time, you know, because the economy's gone bad, tourist season's way down. We're in the middle of a drought. Everything's burning to the ground right now, and we're blessed with, with good business right now. Boom and bust in the minerals industry has become part of the Wyoming fabric, as much as rodeos and the tourist trade. The challenge remains how to turn it into the best situation possible where communities and the energy industry are good neighbors. Wyoming needs this. It needs the energy, it needs the coal, it needs the gas, it needs it. Needs it. And there's just no two ways about it. Um, I don't want to be California. I don't want people to come from California if they want to live like they lived in California. You know, um, if you don't like the oil and you don't like the coal and you don't, that's okay, but stay home. We're not coming to your state and making you do it, so don't come to our state and, and make us live the way you live in California, which, by the way, <laughs> isn't doing so hot. So apparently we're doing something right. But um, it's not only people's livelihoods, but it's, it's history. It's Wyoming history. It's, you know, I mean, there's generations of people that have worked out at the mines here. It's generations that have worked on the railroads that haul the coal out of the mines. And then also, you know, we've got the uranium mines down and, and the gas and the oil and stuff. And it's generations of people. I learned it from my dad. I learned it from my big brother. And they do it for a reason. It's, it's not because they're not getting anything out of it. And it's not always just because of the money, you know. It's, well, like your son. Yeah. Exactly, he loves what he does.